about 20 years ago, I was um, in Europe doing a series of um, teaching workshops. And I was in the UK, and my host was driving me around. And all of a sudden, I got a flash of like a, a little mound or a small hill with a bunch of cows. And I said, uh, are there any cows in this area? And she says, no, I'm not aware of any. And so we're driving a few minutes. And all of a sudden, I see the mound on the right that I flashed on a few minutes earlier. I said, could you stop? So she pulls over. And I walk uh, up toward that mound. And as soon as I get to the top of it, Lo and behold, there's about 50 or 60 cows right there. And I just get really touched. And I sit down on the ground. I close my eyes. And what comes out of my mouth? This little light of mine, I'm going to make it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to make it shine. And so I'm just singing, I'm just singing. And all of a sudden I open my eyes and the cows are right here. <laughs> I mean, just like all of you are right here, except, you know, I was singing to the choir. <laughs> and so I close my eyes and I continue to sing. And all of a sudden I hear, <laughs> And that was, uh, that's what I got reminded of when we were singing this morning. So my fiance, Deborah, and I um, are running around the West Coast on a book tour. And um, Kristen was so sweet to invite us to stop by. So we're so grateful to be here with you today. You know, I don't. I don't plan any of these things. I just come and then something starts speaking through me. And so I wait to see when the guidance comes. And it was this morning about 6.30, I was in the shower, and all of a sudden the word <coughs> unity came. Unity. Unity. Oneness, inseparability. And I realized, wow, you don't think of that often. What, what's the significance of that term? And of course, we live in a world of duality. This is good, this is not so good. But here you're coming together to experience Oneness, unity, and that's beautiful on Sunday. But now we have to talk about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We go to church on Sunday, we go to synagogues on Saturday, we pray to God, and then we often fall asleep the rest of the week. God must be laughing. <laughs> we live on Maui, Hawaii, and um, the culture is very beautiful there. And one of the expressions you often hear is no kaoi, which means nothing like it. The nothing like it that they're talking about is the spirit of aloha. Aloha is the genetic matrix of the Hawaiian culture. It has to do with love, <laughs> peace, and compassion. Not as something we do, as something that we literally are. We are love, we are peace, we are compassion. 
And when we are those things, there's a contagious essence that flows out. Gandhi was giving a, a talk to many thousands of people in India. And when he finished his talk, he stepped up on the train and the train started pulling out of the station and Gandhi was waving to all the people that had come. And all of a sudden, this journalist is running along with the train. He says, Mr. Gandhi, Mr. Gandhi, what's your message for the people? And Gandhi said, my life is my message. His life was love, peace, and compassion. How do we enter this state of grace where actions speak louder than words and the actions are not even actions. They're just the breath that flows through us. The loving kindness, the fact that we always say yes to the opportunity of assisting someone in whatever way we can. We can't thank the person at the restaurant who serves us our coffee enough times. The tip is important, but how often do you look at them and realize, wow, they're amazing. What a great job their mom and dad did and actually share that with them. So we come into a state of love and peace and compassion. When through grace, there is an unconditionality that enters our life. We become unconditionally accepting. It's not whether they do it the way I like it or not. You see yourself in everyone. <clears throat> Believe me, when we feel pain, we all feel the same pain. We all feel the same loss, the same grief, the same terror, the same worrying. We all feel all of that. And when we recognize that we all do, wow, there's just such a natural embrace for the other because as I said before, we're in the same boat and thank God we're in the same boat. So this is not a new idea. 1,450 years ago, the great Zen patriarch, Sengsten, said, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. When love and hate are both absent, the world is clear and undisguised. Make the slightest distinction, however, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. If you wish to see the truth, hold no opinions for or against anything. Jesus said something similar. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus is quoted as saying, when you see up as down and down as up, when the outside and the inside are the same, when you see a man as a woman and a woman as a man, then you shall enter the kingdom. That was the truth that shall set you free. That's what he was speaking about when he said, when thine eye be single, not seeing from this point of view or this point of view, but a level of seeing that is not based on our ideas, our beliefs, our concepts or our theories, but literally a profound experience where our seeing 
and the seeing of God are the same eyes. And then something profound happens when that occurs. It has nothing to do with doing anything or making anything happen. It comes free of charge. 41 and a half years ago, I entered my daily meditation. At that time, I was a traditionally trained eye doctor and vision scientist. And I'd been wearing glasses, like many of you, for almost 10 years. I went into this state. I had my eyes closed. My glasses were off. And all of a sudden, everything seemed clear in the space, even though my eyes were closed. Everything was not just clear, it was scintillating. It was alive, it was sparkly. Almost like a level of reality that I wasn't accustomed to. And the seeing was more than optical clarity. The clarity was so profound that it silenced that part that has questions. There were no questions. And the clarity was everywhere. Whatever was seeing, was seeing from everywhere at the same time. I can't tell you what happened. I had nothing to do with it. I just got a chance to be there. But when I opened my eyes, my eyesight was crystal clear. And prior to that, all I could see without my glasses was that big E on the eye chart. In my state of shock, I drove to my office to try to figure out what had happened. I checked myself over and over again on all different eye charts I had never looked at before. And by God, I was seeing 300% better. So I placed myself behind the phoropter, that instrument that the eye doctor puts in front of your face. And in my own way, I was asking myself, is it better number one or number two? <laughs> I finally realized why my patients used to say, can I see that again? It's very confusing. When I finished, I came out from behind my instrument thinking that the instrument would say zero, plano, no prescription. Because of course, I was trained to believe that when your eyes begin to deteriorate because of nearsightedness or farsightedness or astigmatism, the optical measurements of your eyes change. That's why they give you glasses to compensate for the optical measurements. So now I'm seeing 300% better without squinting or straining. And I figure the only way this can occur is if the prescription is not there, but that's supposed to be impossible. I come out from behind my chair and I notice that the prescription in the device is almost identical to what's in my glasses. Now, let me see if I can explain that again. I'm able to see 300% better, but my eyes haven't changed at all. Now, that stumped me. How does that happen? And of course, you know, we have all these theories about how life works, how the body works, and so on. But then you have a single instance of a direct experience. A direct experience is not something I experience. 
It's something like an epiphany that happens in an instance when we're not there. Just something is just clear. The only thing I could conclude based on this direct experience is that whatever is seeing within us is not the eye. It's something that may work along with the eye, but it's a little different than that. This morning uh, at the earlier service, when we did the longer meditation, I spoke about noticing. And noticing that the reason that all of us are aware that there's worry or thinking or concern or anything that you experience within the mind, the reason we're all aware of that is because something is noticing it. And that something is not it. So when you're looking at your television, you know you're not the television. But when it's happening 360 degrees inside what we think is our head or our mind, we're sure it's us. And it's confusing. So we think all of these things that are going on in the mind are us. But what I invite you to consider is, in order to be aware of this activity in the mind that we're all aware of all the time, or sensation in the body, the only way that can occur is if something is observing it. And what I am inviting you to consider is that who we are is that something. And that might be what our whole life is about, to uncover who is the seer? What is that essence? Could that be that little spark of God that's within all of us? Because that part that sees doesn't speak has no commentary, has no desire, has no point of view. It just notices. So according to Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas, we enter the kingdom when we don't have that point of view when we see everything equal. According to Sengston, when love and hate are both absent, everything is clear and undisguised. It tells us something. I found it rather fascinating when I was working on this latest book, Luminous Life, I happened to, because the word belief is very common these days, Oh, that's your belief system and so on, or you need to change your belief system. So I put the word belief into the thesaurus on my computer to find out all the other words that meant the same as belief. And the words that came up were idea, thought, um, concept, theory. All of that meant the same as belief. And then my eyes... Something caught my eye and took my eye down the page to the antonyms, those things that mean the opposite of belief. And you know what word it took me to? Truth. The truth shall set you free. What it was saying is that our ideas, our beliefs, and so on, are not truth. They might be a changing thing, like science. All of these things have value. 
But the truth that Jesus was speaking about, the one that shall set you free, the one that has the potential to bring our physical state back to its default setting, to create the shift in the eyesight or the spontaneous remission, that's a different kind of truth. That's an unchanging truth. An unchanging truth. So, how do we get in touch with the unchanging truth? I was uh, asked to speak at this conference in Los Angeles uh, about a week, week and a half ago, early on my book tour, and there were all these vendors, all of them you know, selling their goods or their services or whatever it was. And as you walk down, on some level, they're all letting you know that what they have, be it a vitamin, a mineral, a technique, a prayer, energetic healing, whatever it is, it'll heal you. And I'm saying, wow, how does anybody know what's, what's, tr what's the truth here? We're all looking for the great way, the one that's not difficult for those who have no preferences. How do we enter that state? That's really the ultimate question. Because that's what leads to something beyond health and happiness. That's what brings us into a state of contentment. <sighs> Not something that's changing based on the external conditions but a steady state somewhere inside. And so this morning at the earlier service, I talked about that expression we all hear every so often. Ah, it caught my eye. Do you ever wonder what the it is? Well, I'll tell you what I've learned. Don't believe anything I say, but just consider it. <laughs> the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, it says, let there be light. But then on the fourth day, it said, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars, meaning there's a difference between this light that we experience as brightness, which is not light at all, and then this light of creation. And then the Bible says that God is light, and God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. What's fascinating is if you study light, something that is totally invisible, can never be magnified enough to see it, something that is not a thing, it's just an essence of infinite potentiality. If you examine this, you notice something fascinating. It behaves as if it is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Different language is used to describe it in science, but they mean exactly the same thing. We think we know what light is. There's the light, right? But it's only because during the day we experience light as brightness. But brightness is something within our perception. It's not a quality that has to do with light. Go into outer space where it's filled with light and it's as black and dark as black could be. So we experience light during the day as brightness and we experience light during the night as darkness. But we are being touched by the light all the time. 
When I wrote my first book in 1991 and introduced the science of light to the greater community in the book Light Medicine of the Future, I spoke about all the uses of light, the biological effects of light and its use in everything from cancer to learning disabilities. And the major conclusion that came out of that book is that the purpose of light is to guide us into a state of oneness with the cosmos. I think you call that unity. October 2nd of 2017, the Nobel Prize for medicine or physiology was won by three US scientists that discovered the molecular, the aspect molecularly of our cells that is continually responding to the day and night and regulating every aspect of our physiology. We are inseparable from this thing called light, which the Bible refers to as God. We are literally inseparable from it. Every physiological function is light dependent. Your eyes can perceive and respond to one photon of light. That's the, the edge of quantum physics. It means that we are designed to respond and detect to the formless, the invisible, before it becomes visible. So your instinct, your insight, your precognitions, your feelings about things, those are the words you use to describe the tickling, the subtle tickling we get from this invisible essence called light or God. And why do we get those signals? So that we may be guided to fulfill our purpose for being. An apple tree could sit at the foot of a guru and meditate for years, undergo radical psychotherapy, enter into all kinds of spiritual practices, but it will never create bananas. <laughs> its design, its purpose is to create beautiful apples. Each of us are like different sorts of trees. Some of us provide shade, shelter, some of us provide food for others. Some of us have thorns to protect some other aspect. If you look at plants, animals, and humans, they all have measurable consciousness. They all feel pain. The leaves on a on a, a plant, know the difference between a drop of water and the bite that's about to come from a caterpillar. What am I saying? Godliness is everywhere. Everywhere. And now we're going beyond just the spiritual. I'm saying the science and the spirituality say precisely the same thing. I want you to consider that this idea that we're looking for life may not be correct. That in actuality, life may be looking for us. Guiding us continually. The same animating force that moves the planets in our solar system on a precise orbit which has an influence on everything in the cosmos. That same animating force that moves the tides, changes the seasons, tells a bear's coat to get thick because it's going to be cold three months from now, informs the birds when to fly south well before there's any awareness that winter is coming. All creatures reproduce because of changes in light in the environment. 
We used to do it the same way. Now we have lights on around the clock. Go out into outer space, look at Sydney, Australia, London, New York City, Los Angeles, Hong Kong, and you'll notice something interesting. Those parts of the globe are never dark. The lights are on 24 hours a day. That's called light pollution. I said before that everything in our physiology is inseparable from the day and the night cycle. So what happens when you have light around the clock? Oh, the people that perceive that at night? Much higher incidences of all kinds of cancers and many other types of problems. So what am I saying? The truth is really important. The guidance that we receive, it's critical to our contentment in life, to our health, to our wellness, to our everything. Notice what's catching your eye because what's catching your eye is looking for you. Why is it looking for you in this particular instance? Because at this instance, you're getting your next directive. And the directive doesn't come as something you hear. It just comes like a bolt of lightning. It's just clear. And that's called inspiration. You're inspired to move towards something, to, to sell a new house, where to put the needle on your next patient, which way to go. That guidance is nothing to think about. It's precise. It's the first feeling that your teacher said was the right one. So notice what's catching your eye. Notice where it's taking you. Whatever enters your awareness is looking for you. Whatever is looking for you, be with that in that moment. Complete that and you will learn presence and that truth will set you free. Thank you.